This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Yeah. Um, today I'll talk about the Cantonese community in Mulumian from the mid 19th century. This story of Chinese in Mulumian is kind of extension of my doctoral project on the history of Burmese Chinese and with new materials collected last summer when I visited Mulumian. And uh, uh, I want to make a story of Mollyman, not only because this is Burma is my field, but also uh, about the, the famous theory of clone, uh, pro society and marketplace by J.S. Furnival, and uh, try to see how his theory came into being because Furnival was a colonial officer in Burma. And uh, for many years, where he got his experience of the colonial state policy and practice, and especially he wrote a good book on the early administration in Mollumian, in the kind of art of Levison. So, but uh, what I want to say is, I may not want to challenge the, the marketplace, but at least I want to show there are more subtleties, varieties, and possibilities beyond Furnival's marketplace. So first of all, the, the brief of Molomian and the early days of British rule in Burma. So after the first Anglo-Burmese war, uh, the British got two Burmese regions. One is the, um, to the Indian, East Indian Company, Arakan and Tinasari. Kakada decided to rule its <coughs> neighboring Arakan directly and ask the government of Penang to govern and uh, from 1827, the administrative center of both civil and military governing of British Burma was firmly based in Mollumian at the northern, actually it was the northern end of the entire British ter territory. It remained the center of British Burma until 1862 when Burma was officially created as a part of in, uh, British India and Rangoon was became the provincial capital. And uh, what we can see from the map is Smaller Man was at the Mount River Mouth of Salon River and at the Gulf of Mataban and actually the whole Andaman Sea. Actually, f before the colonial time, it was its sister town just crossed the, the river on the other side of the bank, the river bank. It's called Mataban, who played a very significant role of inter Asia maritime trade throughout the days. However, now Mataban was under the Burmese king's control, so the British decided to explore the full potential of Mollyman and within in a few decades build a cosmopolitan port city from the scratch. So um, the colonial establishment quickly dominated the landscape of Mollyman. This is an 1836 map by a visiting American Baptist missionary where you can almost see or the basic structure of central Mollyman as it is today. Uh, the town was built along the waterfront, the river Saloon, and then with uh, several par paralleling thoroughfare uh, like Low May Road, Upper May Road, they're, they're still there, so it's still called the same name, and the uh, Hosey Road. Actually, one of the thoroughfare uh, was properly named as Strand as perhaps the first name, first strand in Burma, which were to be followed by its namesakes in Rangoon, much famous later years. So within the first few decades, well, I don't know if you can see, there are like customer house, jails, office, and then a few bazaar, bazaar uh, markets and schools. You can see the English or Judson schools, as well as religious institutions in the primary location. In 1860, the town had five urban districts and one cantonment with more than 20 properly named or also maybe properly paved or constructed streets. A new colonial port like Mollyman attracted people from near and far, in addition to all those regular visitors from the pre-colonial inter-Asian maritime trade like Siamese, Chinese, Malay, Arabs, or Persians, the colonial establishment brought a large number of Europeans, Eurasians, and particularly various groups from India. Came as government employees, soldiers, camp followers, artisans, laborers, merchants, and prostitutes. 
Uh, actually, before the Andaman Islands became the penal colony, uh, Tinisarin was where Bengal sent its convicts to from 1830. So a government records show that its first two land grants was made in 1845 and 1847, respectively, saying that we are giving the government was giving free land to the town's Muslim population to specially build mosque. So, which means it's kind of the community start to take in shape. And uh, well, that's the multi ethnic. That's the today. I, I took the picture last year, but more or less they are all the leftover of those days. Um, Western religious institutions also very active. Molyman was the headquarter for Judson and his colleagues of the American Baptist Church, set up the first ever, that's, that's still there, the first ever Baptist Church of Burma in 1827. Then comes also English Baptist Church, Church of England, also partly as a service to the army and office. And also the Roman Catholic as well, they, they built the mo one of the most renowned school in the British Burma that it was. St. Patrick's schools. Um, well, there are more, that's most, all sorts of uh, mosque, Hindu temple, northern style, southern style. And uh, informal census taken in 1838 and 1841 shows the demographic breakdown in the town of Mon only in the town of Bolivian, with still dominantly Burmese and Hmong, but also including some day workers traveling from the Burmese controlled side of the other side of the river. But still, you can see slowly going up for the foreigners as Malay, Chinese, Europeans, Indians. Actually, after three decades after this census, in 1872, there were the first ever proper uh, census in Burma taken uh, uh, in line with Indian type of the census. Only slightly and very suspiciously more than half of the population were still the indigenous peoples. Uh, the rest of them are Indians, Chinese, or Siamese of that. So that's kind of background of Molyman. Talk about the Chinese. The Chinese were there from the very beginning. If you remember that the, uh, the first two commissioners of Tinasring were sent to or sent from Penang, which where was an, an established Chinese community was already thriving, so they would not be quite familiar with those overseas Chinese and all those issues and the potentials. So it was recorded that in the 1830s, one unsuccessful occasion that uh, the, the commissioner invited uh, someone to import 150 Chinese as traders and miners from Penang to Molyman through a Cantonese agent, but it didn't, didn't work. And uh, but it, uh, even today, Tinasaring has been and still are the locations with relatively large Chinese population. It was said in the 1830s, some 500 or around that number of growing vegetables and fruits in Dangwai, which is the suburb of Molyman. And Chinese carpenters and skilled workers were mentioned, like work for the logistic supplies on the, during the Second Anglo-Burmese War, and also from government reports, newspapers, and journals. And in the last case, you can see the street names reflecting the existence and the location of a Chinese quarter. In the similar fashion, we see Chinatown in many cities today. So as everywhere, in Southeast Asia, Chinese communities almost always were divided by regional and dialect lines based on immigrants' hometowns. And uh, now we go to look at the China, one of the Chinese group, the Cantonese. Actually, in Burma, there were more Hokkien's, Cantonese, and uh, sometimes the Yunnanese from not by sea, but overland from the southwest provincial of China. So the Cantonese. I will look at two particularly brothers, Liang brother cousins, called Liang Chai and uh, Liang Achou, both born in Canton and made their fortune in Molyman in the second half of the 19th century. Liang Chai was born in China, came to Molyman at age of eight, 17, joined his uncle's business, and later started his own business, ranging from spirit, distillery, steamship, sawmill, rice mill, tannery, land property, and credit providing to the rice cultivator. Actually, you can see it as a money lender. 
and uh, also his primary primary premise was on the Lower May Road, which is still there today. It's a large property just next to the Sunni Mosque, purchased in 1877. The building is still today known as Lao Chai Ha, which means Old Chai's Shop by the Cantonese in Mollyman today. They told me that even though they could not speak much Chinese at all, but they still pronounce it in a very Cantonese dialect. Um, Liang Chai worked closely with European companies as agents and maintained a very good relationship with the governments as he was a license, licensee of the country spirits to the entire Tinasarin area. As a successful businessman, representative of the Chinese, he was acknowledged with titles both in his hometown in China and also by the colonial establishment as this kind of all those honoraries, Indian type. See. The flagship of his business called Yi Li is on the <coughs> top, how do you say, on the top of a 1919 uh, management community of this Ningyang Association. Uh, Ningyang Association was a kind of birthplace association of one particular county in southern Canton, where the majority of the Burmese Cantonese were from. Uh, this Ningyang Association that was today it's located on the Lower May Road, just opposite Liang Chai's old shop. And it was established no later than 1845, and still the most important separate place for the Cantonese there. Um, when Liang Chai died in May 1919, it had an impressive funeral ceremony by attended by representatives by, of every community ethnic community in Mordomen and all those Chinese societies in Rangoon made it seen of the town. However, one Rangoon Chinese newspaper, famous for its kind of progressive outlook, criticized Liang Chai's consultants, saying that he still keep his pigtail until his dead day, which that was eight years after the emperor in China was overthrown. Um, Liang Chai's commercial success shared by his cousin Cho, it's a similar story. He came and joined his cousin, in this case, Liang Chai himself, then work, started his own shop and died. And uh, he was bestowed a lot of honorary titles and this and that. And also one of his shops was also in the management committee of the 1919 renovation inscription of the Ningyang Association that he stole. Um, however, if this is a ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-faced colonial cosmopolitan port, the Leon Brothers represent an emerging Cantonese commercial circle development of a mainstream Cantonese community. There also existed alternative stories away from this traditional Chinese expectation, for example, by converting to Christianity. Just look at this um, L family. It's impossible, oh, it's too small. Possible to identify that surname, which could be Liang, but also possible be Li. Both are big name of the Ch Cantonese, or actually Chinese. But their names indicate a typical Cantonese style. The first generation is a Fung, was said to be among the first converts of the Jud of Judson himself. One has to know that successful story like Liang Chai or Atro were very rare, and most of the adventurous immigrants were simply laborers without any resource or luck, just as in this case and grasp whatever the fate happened to strike on them. So as of a Christianity, Christian, a phone visited America, and uh, he was brought to America by a missionary couple and learned printing skills using Burmese and the Karen phones. And uh, after that, the American couple brought him back, and he worked for the missionary print press in Mollyman for this Judson's Bible translation and printing project. I feel married a Christian girl. There's nowhere else to say where what his her ethnicity is, but it's most probably a Karen because those days Karens are the most likely Christians and continue the religious traditions along family. So well, it's too small. Basically, so it's all the sons. One of the sons became a chaplain of the Mon Baptist Church, very active, just before at least before the World War Two. And uh, the conversion to a European religion also paved the way to a circular member of the family. So uh, Liang Cho, unlike Liang Cho, who sent his sons back to China and Penang for a Chinese education, uh, uh, this 
this one of the son was educated in the government school in Bolivar, where obtained of your obvious obtained the necessary training for language or skills before entering the Steel Brothers Company, which was one of the biggest European companies in Burma, doing timber, rice, all the prof profitable things, and. Uh, he, Akon, worked as a broker and uh, as a agency for 45 years in that Steel Brother company. Actually, Atro's son, which perhaps also held as a broker later years. The third generation became more diversified career profile and lifestyle. One received medical education in England, especially um, served in Mesopotamia in the World War I. One joined the military serving in Europe, one worked for the Indo Burma Petroleum Company in, in Rangu, and the other one was a professor in Rangu. Among the granddaughters, one studied in medical college for women at Calcutta. The other one was a superintendent of the Baptist Morton Lake Girls' School. Such professional career, of course, even in the 1920s and 30s, were not widely enjoyed by their fellow Cantonese girls. Um, however, if the Chinese migrants were busy building their trades and work in the towns and villages in Tinasaring, building relation, religious and social networks, the gaze of from the outside, at least as from previous today, Brazil gives a very different impression of the China and Chinese in Burma. One revealing source was the perspective from the English community of the town is the, the Moliman Chronicle, one of the first English newspapers in Burma. It was actually funded by the commissioner himself with, so it's from the very start, it was a close relationship between government and the newspaper. And sometimes it was under very close censorship, strict censorship from Calcutta. It's formal, first and foremost an English publication serving the circle of English society and its associations and refer, reflect their best in administrative or commercial interests. This actually, if you can see, this is also a community that was also busy built establishing themselves and engaging in community building with all those essential institutions, not too different from their Chinese or Muslim or, or Arab counterparts in the town at that time. As a matter of fact, Ch Chinese were seldom mentioned in these European communal publications, except for the regular ship news that inevitably will involve in Chinese junks and passages, or sketchy and generalized information on Chinese rice cultivation in Pinang or Tavoy, or trade of settled words in Maguay Chinese in the miners in the hills. Ironically, interestingly, is that while minimize the Moluman Chinese presence in their daily life, China, or rather the image of China as a mighty but interesting empire, features significantly in the paper, in the newspaper. <coughs> I pick up two most persistent themes throughout the 1830s and 40s as available in the Moliman Chronicles. One was to open up and maintain a direct and a safe route to southwest China via Shan and northern Siamese uh, Thai-speaking states. For this, the government already tried several expeditions, trying uh, like Dr. Richardson, and trying the try to go to. Jing Hong, Jing Dong, Jing Hong, and all the ways, but it was interrupted in following years by those inter-Thai or inter-Shan tensions. The other one uh, was the Opium War. That was the day of the years of the Opium War. Uh, Moluman was an old outpost, a new inclusion of the empire located too far away from the action and was never a strategic site. The only, the only two occasions it came to the first hand interaction was when the troop or the ship returned to India after the war and called upon Moliman as a stopover, as you are kind of cited here. However, the newspaper, through the three years of the war, spent pages and pages following the news before and during the war often relying on much delayed telegraphs from Calcutta, from Singapore, or from London. And uh, while the newspaper always expressed an anxiety of unsatisfactory situation of an overland caravan route, and never failed to press on the issue among the officials and commercial circles, it seems mostly ignored a growing population of the Chinese who was doing business exactly in its nose, or literature next door, next door to where the newspaper was printed. 
which if you really take it seriously, could be used to facilitate some kind of cross-border trade to the hinterland of China market. It happened on a very small scale, mm, not in initiated by the British, but by the Chinese. On the other side, like Burma, the northern Burma, and, uh, but in Molimian, it looks like the foremost uh, attention was to open an overland route. And like in Singapore, from the very beginning, the British uh, intention to deal with China is to invite those uh, Chinese maritime merchants to come over. So, similarly, I'm here. Um, similarly, for this opium war thing, nothing has ever been mentioned about the response or to the war by the local Cantonese, especially the Cantonese community. Given the fact that by that time the Cantonese community had been quite established itself and its connection with other parts of Southeast Asia and their hometown in Canton where the action actually took place was possible if not smooth. It was to nature that the Chinese might get a faster news from its own network than much delayed empire-wide telegraphs, or it was simply possible that they could obtain more detailed and accurate information from relatives or friends or traveling agents, whoever, who might actually witness the war or the second-hand or, or third-hand witness of the war. However, all these approaches were not attempted either from total awareness, unawareness, or from deliberating ignorance, or maybe just a different strategy. So in conclusion, oh, in conclusion, of course, it might be too much to expect a 19th century English language community newspaper to adopt a multi-ethnic outlook. But as the case of the Chinese community in Molimen indicates, every daily life in the early years did show a kind of cosmopolitan tendency if it's not a fully developed reality. So what led Furnival's famous observation of marketplace where people mix but not combine? I intend to agree with recent reinvestigation on Furnival that his account was written more than a century later after establishment of Moliman. It was a reflection of a later colonial or early post-colonial post days prevailing ethnic features in a well-developed discourse of the mid-20th century. That was a discourse based on ethnic stereotype, which we can already see its, its uh, emergency in these Molimian chronicles, and later adopted and further rigidified by colonial policies on racial co compartmenting and segregation. So the marketplace, therefore, is not the beginning, but the result of the colonial practice and discourse. While well, in reality, as the picture of this early monument shows, there were much more potentials, subtleties, varieties of mingling and interaction beyond ethnic, religious, or social boundaries in and beyond the marketplace.